Please welcome Tom McGrath, Philly Mag's editor-in-chief, joined by one of the leading figures in America's tech scene, Josh Koppelman. Thank you, and thank you, Josh, for being here. We're going to have a, a great conversation about Philadelphia's tech scene with one of the leading lights on that tech scene. Before we get to our conversation, though, um, Josh had a video that he actually wanted us to see. So why don't we go ahead and roll that video, and then we'll, we'll talk after that. In 1776, a small group of founders came together right here in Philadelphia to build one of the most ambitious startups in history, the United States of America. Like most entrepreneurs, these founders faced improbable odds and experienced their share of setbacks, but they endured. Philadelphia became the epicenter for a new nation built on a platform of freedom, justice, and opportunity for all. Over 200 years later, a whole new generation of founders, enabled by each and every entrepreneur who came before, are starting up once again with new ideas. Philadelphia remains a smart city to be a founder. Our mission is to help online businesses make smarter decisions by using their own data. Simplify the healthcare payment process. Help great people build great companies. Make events better for the people who organize them and the people who go to them. We knew we had something when months before we launched publicly or got any press, we had huge consumer brands uh, reaching out to us trying to get on board. We have about 45 million searches a month, up from just 7 million. We handle more traffic than Twitter or ESPN. Last year on Black Friday, we had 20% of all online retail spending on our platform. Today we process about $1,000 a second. Philly is a pretty great choice if you're entrepreneurially minded. What we've seen recently is a lot of successes in terms of companies. And it's always great when you have the one company or the two companies that have done great things, but it's great to start to see the avalanche of so many new companies starting here. There's a bootstrapping mentality where people are willing to kind of self-fund things. And there's enough resources in Philly to do the bootstrapping. It's the second largest city in the country in terms of students and universities. We have the University of Pennsylvania, Drexel, Temple, some of the best engineering talent uh, anywhere is created here out of Philadelphia. I was actually really shocked when I got to Penn because I had been sort of coding and doing entrepreneurial things in high school and I never found anyone who did anything similar. But when I got to Penn, there's a really smart core group of people who are really interested in technology and entrepreneurship. So it's been a really great experience for me to be around people who have pushed me to get better at what I do. Wow, that was pretty exciting commercial for Philadelphia. Tell us, why did you want us to see that, that particular video? Well, that, that bit, we put that video together when we announced that we were moving our office from the suburbs, from Conshohocken to right into University City in Philly. And, and we thought that the video sort of captured some of the same trends that we were seeing, which led us to move sort of from the sidelines, I'd say, into the, the heart of the innovation ecosystem here. It certainly captures a, a bit of excitement that's happening these, these, these days in Philadelphia. Is that, is that the same thing that you actually feel? You think? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I've lived in Philadelphia for now 25 years, but I, I, I'd say until recently I felt that Philadelphia is where I lived, but not where I worked. Um, and that I viewed my, where I worked as San Francisco and New York. We, we are a venture capital firm that has offices in San Francisco, New York, and, and, and Philadelphia. Um, but over the last couple of years, we've seen a, a pretty big shift. We've seen some really great companies get their start here in Philadelphia. Uh, companies like Invite Media, which we funded, started here in Philly, uh, sold to Google for $100 million. A company called AdMob got its start here. They also sold to Google, but they sold for $750 million. A company called Milo got its start here, sold to eBay. A company called Warby Parker got its start here and, and is, you know, raised money at, at, at a nine-digit valuation. Those four companies all got their start um, within five blocks of my new office. Um, they've gone on to create well over a billion dollars worth of market value. The only thing that all four of those companies, the only, the only disappointing part about all four of those companies is that they chose to leave Philadelphia after they got their start here. And when you talk to entrepreneurs and ask them why, um, a big reason was access to capital. 
So I want to give people just a little context about how you come into this, this situation, just so a really quick history here. You've been an entrepreneur um, at least since your undergrad days at Wharton, possibly before that. Um, launched several successful startups yourself. You began first round capital in 2004, and since then have been one of the, the country's most active and successful seed level investors. So you really know that this, this, this scene. What I want to get from you is a sense of, um, you know, we're in this amazing era of, of innovation and creativity and entrepreneurship. Philadelphia, despite some of those great examples you've had, has been, I think, a little bit behind the curve, at least when it's compared to places like Silicon Valley, places like Boston and New York. Why is it that you think that, at least until recently, we've, we've lagged behind kind of the trend on this? So I think oftentimes, historically, a lot of these businesses were based, were extremely capital intensive. Um, and so you had network effects that the entrepreneurs would go where the capital was and the capital would go where the entrepreneurs were. Um, and, and so what's happened is that, that you, you've seen the rise of Silicon Valley, which is you know, clearly sort of the epicenter of, of the entrepreneurial ecosystem of the country. But over the last five to 10 years, we've seen a few trends that have actually, I don't think they're threatening Silicon Valley's dominance, but are, but are enabling other ecosystems to, to, to thrive. The cost to start a company, a technology company, have come way down. My first company in 1991, it took $5 million to get to first product ship. Second company took $2 million. Third company took 750,000. And today we're funding companies, we're seeing companies get to first product ship on a couple hundred thousand dollars. So in my own short career, we've seen the cost come way down. The, the iPhone first was invented in 2007. You're talking, you know, five years ago. Um, before the iPhone, if you wanted to build a mobile app, it cost you $2 million and you had to spend 18 months negotiating to get a deal with Verizon or AT&T where you figured out whether they would take 70% of the revenue or 80% of the revenue. <laughs> and, and today, you, any, there, today there are thousands of, of mobile developers in the city's dorm rooms. It's 120 bucks and you're a developer. You have a, so, so the costs have come way down and that's really changed the landscape because it's, you're seeing the democratization of entrepreneurship. You're seeing that what took me when I started my first company five million dollars to get to first product ship, we're now seeing students build companies for five thousand dollars to get to first product ship. Now you need money to scale, you need money to grow, but that democratization of entrepreneurship, that, that lowering the barriers is enabling a number of ecosystems, whether it's Philadelphia or Austin or Pittsburgh, to actually begin to, 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 to have a chance to, to, to create some really interesting entrepreneurial activity. In, in your mind, what, what are some of the key elements that, that any city, and I guess Philadelphia in particular, needs to have in order for that ecosystem really to kind of be, be, to be thriving and, and be, at its, be at its strongest? So there's a great book uh, by Brad Feld called Startup Communities where he walks through this. But, but ironically, the, uh, there's one, th you don't create a startup ecosystem by proclamation or by legislation. It, you can't sort of declare it. Uh, I believe there's really one thing that drives a startup ecosystem, and that is a s successful companies. It, it, there's no ac it's no accident that if you look at YouTube, multi-billion dollar company, Yelp, over a billion dollar exit, Yammer, over a billion dollar exit, LinkedIn, worth almost 30 billion, Tesla, SpaceX, all of these billion dollar companies, it's no accident that all of them were founded by employees of PayPal. They worked at PayPal, they had success, they generated, they generated some wealth, and then they sort of, the, the team, the, like PayPal dropped the seeds that created the next generation. And that's what we've seen in the Valley, by the way. You've seen sort of this like Darwinian theory of like forest creation, where one tree grows up, Fairchild Semi drops the seeds, creates the next generation. So, so when you sit down and say long term, because building a tech ecosystem doesn't work on political cycles, it's not a four year or eight year thing, it's a 20 year thing. But when you sit down and say what, what has the single best hope, it's helping companies in Philadelphia succeed because it doesn't take many. Um, I'll give one example, that company Invite Media I talked about that sold for $100 million, which is small in the tech, in the tech, uh, in the tech sort of uh, scale. $100 million sale, those founders are in New York. Seven of the early employees there have gone on to start new companies. The two, found, two of the founders have angel invested in 40 other companies. And when you sit down and say, now where are those companies that they're angel investing in? They're in their ecosystem that they're in, which are primarily New York. So 
Had that one company stayed here, had AdMob stayed here, you would have had 50 millionaire employees who would have now been angel investors, board directors, mentors, and advisors. So it doesn't take a lot to have a big impact on an ecosystem. And I'm just thinking too, how much that would just literally transform a city like Philadelphia to have all those people suddenly in this, in this world. That's right, while we have angel investors here, a lot, most of the angel investors, and this is not knock, had created their wealth not through technology. They've created it through real estate or through other industries. So, so they don't have the experience to, to be able to provide that sort of hands-on mentorship that someone, that the angel investors who might have created their wealth through technology startups uh, can provide. So, so it just takes a few to tip. Um, and, and, and what excites me about what we're seeing in Philadelphia is we're seeing a, a, a tremendous increase in terms of the number of companies that are attracting outside capital that are getting, that are getting started. So not just the companies that we're invested in, but just all, all across the ecosystem. In, in your mind, are there actually some any advantages that Philadelphia might have over places like Boston or Austin or Silicon Valley or even New York? Sure. Um, so I started all three of my companies here in Philadelphia. And the competition for talent is hard everywhere, right? So everyone says, oh, it's hard to hire people in Philadelphia. I'll tell you, it's hard to hire people in Silicon Valley. <laughs> it's hard to hire people in New York. Um, but in the Valley, you have people that change jobs without changing parking spots. There's just so many... Uh, companies, and in the Valley, if your company, oftentimes you find that there's such pressure that if your company is not going straight up, employees, it's very easy for them to get on that next rocket ship. In Philadelphia and, and the ecos around here, there is less competition for the talent. We have strong universities, um, which are, I think, an undervalued resource here. And, and, and we're seeing a shift on the university side. We're now seeing more people um, expressing an interest in working at a startup um, at Penn than, than, than investment banking, which, which is surprising, right? Because um, it was always a school that was focused in that regard. So, so we're seeing those, those signs of light. I also feel that the quality of life is, is, is extremely strong here. Well, that's gonna make a difference too in terms of attracting talent, right? If you can actually have a real life here. It does as companies grow. In the startup phase, um, very few startups optimize for work-life balance, right? Nobody has a life anyway That's when you're right. starting a company? When you're starting a company, you, you, you're just so focused. You know, most, most successful founders, if you ask them, you know, to pick any place on the planet, if you told them that they'd have a 15% better chance of succeeding in Poland, they'd all be in Poland. <laughs> Um, I'm curious about actually how your own life has changed since your company has moved from Conshohocken into, into West Philly. And I, you wrote on your blog that you traded a, a five-minute commute for something a little bit longer. But I'm curious just day to day, has it made a difference in, in how you operate? Yeah. It, you know, so look, I'm still spending my time in all of our offices, but I'm spending more time in Philadelphia than I ever had. And I also find that it's just a very different environment. We took an office that was, uh, I'd say, 60% larger than we needed, and we've given a lot of space to startups and to college students, and it's, and it's just a much more sort of buzzing environment rather than sort of disappearing into sort of an office park in Conshohocken and for the day. It, it, I, I just enjoy being surrounded by innovation. And it also led us to create this dorm room fund, um, which really is, has been a lot of fun. Well, let's talk a little, about, a little bit about that because uh, you know, you've know really tapped into the idea that, that, that you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and all sorts of other people have, so many companies have been created at that, you know, when people are, are so young. So talk a little bit about sort of the inspiration for what that idea was. So I created my first company. I co-founded it when I was a sophomore. And uh, two years after I, I graduated from college, we went public and now, so while I created a company in, in college, we, we've seen lots more, far more successful companies get created in college. Microsoft, created in a dorm room. Yahoo, created in a dorm room. Dell, created in a dorm room. Google, created in a dorm room. Facebook, like these, like if you look at the, almost all of the successful tech companies were actually created by college students in a dorm room. Yet, and, and we've seen, the, as I talked about, the cost to start these companies have come way down, way down. Yet, the funding for college students hasn't really changed. Um, venture capitalists aren't gonna fund a sophomore. So who's, they're not gonna say, here's 30 grand, you finish school, and, and, and you know, that's, not what work, that's not how it works. There are a bunch of accelerators and incubators that have popped up, but they typically encourage students to drop out to pursue their idea again, because they don't wanna fund someone. So, you know, if you're a student in school, 
the person you're going to ask for money are still friends and family, the same people you would ask before. So we thought, wouldn't it be neat if we created a fund that was just targeted at student entrepreneurs? So we allocated $500,000 for Philadelphia-based student entrepreneurs. We wanted to fund 20,000 into 25 companies over two years in the Philadelphia region. And to make it more exciting, we said, well, who's going to help? Who's, gonna, who's the real person that knows the good student entrepreneurs? Who's connected? It's not us. And it's really not the faculty, it's these it's students. So we said we wanted to pick a student investment committee. Instead of me and my partners uh, making the investment decision, we wanted to create the dorm room fund and have student partners. So we announced this last year, about this time, and had 700 people attend information sessions, 700 college students attend. 200 went through the application process, we picked 11. And since we, we picked the investment team in December, they have now funded eight Philadelphia dorm room based companies are on 20, 000, an average of 20,000. And it's been, it's been really, I think, successful. When we started it, we knew it was gonna be an experiment. And we, we, we knew it was gonna be spectacular. We just didn't know whether the word was gonna be a spectacular success or a spectacular <laughs> failure. Um, and since we started that in Philadelphia, we've now uh, taken the idea to New York, San Francisco, and Boston, and, and put 500,000 in each of those cities. Uh, but, but, you know, and, and people don't realize how powerful the universities are. If you look, and how about Philadelphia? If you look at, the uh, New York Times recently did a study where they ranked all the national universities by, not by salaries, not by you know, employment, but by how many of their gra recent graduates have gotten venture funding. And, and Wharton Penn was number three. It was right up there. It was ahead of Harvard and MIT. Um, so we think it's a real opportunity to, to sort of help and. To, to get engaged at an early level. You, you mentioned that, that great long list of amazing companies that started when, when kids were in college. What is it, I mean, why is that happening? Why are there so many great co companies that start at that, at that level? I mean, it's just, just, is it the beer? Is there something going on there? <laughs> no, I think, I, think, um, I think historically entrepreneurship has been a young person's game. Um, I think that undergraduates in particular, there are no footprints in the snow. The, you know, when we, when I've seen companies when you hire someone who's been out of school for four years, who's been doing a job, they know how to do that job. They've done it before. They know how things should work. Undergraduates have no idea how things should work, and they're not bound by any constraints. Quick story. My first company, we, you know, we started in a small place and finally got an office and hired an undergraduate to be the office manager. Never worked at a company before. His first day on the job, we said, all right, we're going to need a photocopier. Go get the photocopier. Um, he... You know, next day, a truck pulls up, drops the copier off, plugs it in. So that's like Tuesday at, at noon. They drop the copier, plug it in. That's great. The next Tuesday, I'm in a meeting. I see the truck pull up, pick up the copier, take it out. An hour later, another truck pulls in and plugs in another copier. I'm like, oh, it must have been broken. Following Tuesday at noon, another truck pulls up, takes that copier. I'm, now I have to ask him, what's with the copier? He goes, well, you didn't give me a budget. So I was going through the phone book, and there are about 50 some odd places, and they'll all give away a one week free trial. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're good for a year. Uh, you know, and, and, and if you had ever, ever worked as an office manager, ever worked in a company before, you never would have thought of that. Like, <laughs> that wouldn't have crossed your mind. But, you know, but that's kind of like the way that undergraduates approach these problems that, that, that is refreshing and I think oftentimes sort of is just very orthogonal to the way other people might. <laughs> I'm looking for David Lipson. This is a good idea for the magazine. You can save some money this way. So, um, you know, one of the knocks you hear on, on Philadelphia as a pace for business in general is, is the tax structure here and some of, and some of the, the tax burdens. Um, and I'm wondering how much of a challenge that is from, from your perspective. My view is that taxes for startups aren't one of the top, if you were to interview those four companies that started here and ask them why they left, taxes wouldn't have been a reason at all. Because for startups, um, when you sit down and look at why people talk about Philly's tax system maybe being oppressive, it's because there's a revenue tax and there's a profits tax. Startups in the first two years have very little of each, very little revenue and very little, uh, you know. And, and yes, there's a payroll tax here, but capital gains in Pennsylvania is much lower than in New York or, or, or California. And when you sit down and look at what are entrepreneurs playing for, why are people joining startups? They're joining startups for the value of the stock options, which are taxed at capital gains. So if you actually, we did this analysis, we took the, the path of a, typical, a prototypical company, 
starts with two employees, goes to 10 employees, grows to 40 employees, revenue grows, profit kicks in in year four, company sells in year six, like a prototypical VC company. And you look at the total tax bill, the tax bill of the, sal the, the payroll taxes, the tax bill of the revenue taxes, the tax bill of the profit taxes, and the tax bill of the capital gains. Philadelphia is far cheaper for startups uh, than New York, San Francisco, California, or Boston. Now, once a company gets large beyond year four, and, and once a company gets large and is producing a lot of revenue and a lot of profit, yes, that's when it comes into play, and that's oftentimes where Philadelphia finds itself in competition with its suburbs. Are there things we, that we should be doing at that level to make sure that if we do launch some great companies here that suddenly that, that they're actually going to stick around and, and, you know? So I think that the, I'm here as an accident, right? I started my company as an undergrad and graduated, I had 20 employees. Uh, and, and I was going to go to the Valley, I'm not from Philadelphia originally, um, but I've stayed here ever since and because and, my employees had husbands and wives, boyfriends, girlfriends, kids in school, owned homes. And a lot, I, I, so my view is that I think that there's a magic point, 15 to 20 employees, uh, beyond which it, it becomes very hard for a company to become portable. Uh, small companies, teams of six, they're very portable. And, and one of the challenges is that all of our business attraction and retention efforts tend to be focused, we want to attract large companies to come. And if we're going to spend real resources to keep a company here, we're going to try to keep a large company here. And I think it's oftentimes the, the, the companies below 15 which are going to become the next company. So, so if you're asking me sort of where to focus, yeah. it would be on trying to get companies from five people to 20 people while, at, while they're in Philadelphia. And, and, and the dorm room fund plays a small role in that, right? Because I started my company my sophomore year, and by the time I graduate, I have people. And we're hoping that if we start funding companies, their freshman, sophomore, junior years, they might have people, might have more roots to the area as well. Great. So you brought your son with you today. I met, met him backstage. He's decked out in his flyers gear. It's been a tough year so far, but that's okay. <laughs> um, we wrote a story in the, in the magazine this month all about kind of a shift in, in our trend you're starting to see in education of trying to get younger kids much more interested in entrepreneurship and, you know, even in, in grade school and middle school and so forth. Do you think that's a good idea? Yes. Tell me why. I think bro big picture if our society is going to advance, if our society is going to innovate solutions to some of our biggest problems, they're going to come from startups rather than big companies. Those solutions come, like, I, I've had the opportunity to, to, to work in startups and then sell them to big companies. And I've seen what happens to the pace of innovation after the acquisition rather than before. So I'm a believer that, that when you look at economic growth, you know, Almost all economic growth in our society is driven by small companies rather than large in terms of number of new jobs, but also in terms of innovation. So, so I think if entrepreneurship plays a really important role if we're going to solve some of our biggest problems. Um, and, and, and I think that, uh, that entrepreneurship is all about embracing risk, you know, understanding a hypothesis design and how to, how to sort of uh, validate or test your uh, your hypotheses, and and it, sh and, and it and I think it should be sort of mainstreamed. It should, it, and, and when you look at most universities, for example, when I graduated Penn uh, 20 some odd years ago, and they give you this survey where you had to fill out, because they want to track where all of their graduates are going, how many become bankers, how many become consultants, how many uh, become lawyers and doctors, and I had started my own company, and, and in the early 90s, like the only box I could check was unemployed. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and we've now seen that change where a large number of people are, are, are entrepreneurship, and, and it's tiny things. It's the movie, The Social Network, which kind of gets people saying, wow, and it's the stories of these type of companies. But, but I think it's extremely important both for our economy and, and, and for sort of the future of, of, our, of our country. L one last question. Look out five years. Where do you think Philadelphia's tech scene is likely to be? So I, I, I want to beware the... the I want to beware of trying to compare it to Silicon Valley. I, I think that's a mistake. When people say, you know, trying to compare Philly to Silicon Valley, Philly is a great Chinatown. I go there all the time. I, it's a great experience. But I don't think anyone in Chinatown aspires to say, how can we make Chinatown better than China? Um, and, and, <laughs> and, and I don't think that we should be aspiring to do that. I, rather, what I think we should be aiming for is, 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 farm, you know, is to continue the pace that we've seen 
of capital coming in from outside the region to fund companies. It sh all the capital shouldn't have to come here. Continuing to see companies grow. A company that's in my, that, that, that now is 200 employees, Monetate, started in my office is two. And, and, and what I'm hoping is five years from now, when Monetate has sort of joined that list of the billion dollar outcomes, hopefully, um, that seven to ten of their employees will start other companies and that, that their early employees will become the angel investors. And I think that we're beginning to see that be the, the, having lived here now for over 20 years, I think we've seen more change in the last three years than in the prior 17. That's exciting. That's all we have time for. Very much appreciate your time. Josh Koppelman, thank you. Koppelman, thank you.